In this program, Lou and his guest experts will help you understand and expand your empathy. In doing so, you may discover a side of yourself that you never even knew existed. Now, here is Lou Augusta. Hi, hi, this is Lou Augusta. Welcome to the show, A Rumor of Empathy. Today, my special... Today, my special guest is dropping the phone. Today, my special guest is Jonathan Brent, executive director of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York City. Uh, so uh, I understand he's uh, dropping the phone literally, and uh, so he may uh, dial back in. Let me give a short introduction to who Jonathan is and the work he's doing, and uh, from 1991 to 2009, Jonathan was editorial director and associate director of Yale Press. He's the founder of the world acclaim Annals of Communism series, which he established at Yale University Press in 1991. He's the co-author of Stalin's Last Crime, The Plot Against the Jewish Doctors, 1948 to 1953, from Harper Collins and the author of Inside the Stalin Archives, At Last uh, Books 2008. Jonathan is now working on a biography of the Soviet Jewish writer, Isaac Babel. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks very much for having me, Lou. Hey, it's good to have you here. And I understand, you know, between technical difficulties and scheduling, sometimes these things are extremely dynamic and challenging. But, I'm, <laughs> yeah, that, that, you know, I, but we're going to make it work, right? right I mean, good, good. You know, to, I, I, I'm going to say one thing. To err as human, to really mess things up requires the Internet. <laughs> so we're fully into that. But, you know, we're here to acknowledge and in, in a proper way, recognize and maybe even celebrate. What, what's, tell me about YIVO. What, you're the executive director there. Hey, right. hey our, our listeners don't necessarily, you know, uh, is founded by Einstein and Freud. What's, going, what's, it, what's it about? Well, uh, you know, YIVO, it, it, it's an acronym. Uh, it is the first Yiddish organization in the world uh, that was uh, founded for the purpose of studying the Jewish people of Eastern Europe and Russia. Hmm. And, of course, uh, the way East European Jews, who constituted the majority of Jews in the world at that time, that is 1925, how yeah. they influenced uh, America and Germany and everywhere else. So, uh, YIVO actually stands for Yiddisher Wissenschaftlicher Institute. And those of you who know German, you know that Wissenschaft <laughs> means, uh, means sci uh, science, uh, scientific uh, research. Um, and that's what YIVO was devoted to. But at the same time, in 1925, it had a public uh, function as well. It was not just research and scientific uh, inquiry. It was also set to organize uh, the education of the Jewish people of Eastern Europe and uh, about themselves, about their history. It's very difficult for people who've grown up in the United States, for Jews and non-Jews alike, to realize that at the beginning of the 20th century, the, yeah. Jew, the Jewish people had no idea what their history was in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And actually, anywhere. They knew Talmud, they knew Torah, they knew rabbinic literature, they knew uh, certain myths, but they had yeah. no idea how they got from the Sinai Desert to Warsaw. Yeah. And, and thereby hangs a tail, to say the least. Well, Absolutely. And, and without that knowledge, a huge part of their actual identity was missing, because their personal, actual identity cannot be replaced just by a religious identity. And that's what the founders of Evo recognized. And actually, in fact, the, uh, Max Weinreich, who was one of the founders, uh, was very, very interested in contemporary psychoanalytic theory. 
mm. and and uh, depth psychology. And so he he translated Freud into Yiddish, and uh, he, and Freud was invited to join the Evo board, as was Albert Einstein. Wait a minute. Uh, Let me stop you. Pause for a breath mm-hmm. on that one. That is a remarkable statement. I mean, we must also define our terms for the benefit of those listeners who may not have heard of Isaac Basheva Singer and uh, Isaac Babel and Yiddish. Yiddish. Mm-hmm. What is Yiddish? Well, uh, that's a good question also, because uh, at, ni- at the time Evo was founded, Yiddish was considered a jargon. It was a doggerel kind of a uh, a dialect of German, a bastardized German, uh, and uh, even a writer like Sholem Aleichem uh, refers to it as jargon. But the Evo Institute understood that, first of all, it was the language, for better or worse, that was spoken by about six million Jews at the time. Uh, a number, note the number. This is uh, yes, significant. Uh, and you know, this is going to get significant quickly. But and and yeah. furthermore, that it had rules, and it could be taught, and it was written down, and there was already at the time at the end of the nineteenth century a significant body of literature. Uh, in in Yiddish, uh, Sholem Aleichem is just one example, but there's Yud Lamed Peretz, there's uh, uh, Mendel Mocher Sfarim, there are many, many others. And Yiddish began, in fact, somewhere around the 12th century. Hmm. And it developed over time, over a long period of time. It went through many different phases. And Part of Yivo's mission was to prove that Yiddish was actually a language yeah. in and of itself. Right. And a it's combination, what... I'm going to give a little color here and kind of work with me and, and pardon the uh-huh. interruption. I mean, it's a mixture of German and Yiddish. I mean, Yiddish, and that is to say Hebrew. It's, uh, uh, it's borrowing well, it's, from both languages, as I yeah, understand. It's a mixture. Some people think that Yiddish actually began in France, but huh. it's a mixture of German. Hebrew, Russian, Polish, French. Uh, there is some Scandinavian. There, there's some Swedish, and all the it. European languages. So we've all got, as you say, languages. a jargon, a uh, a a mixture. That's uh, right. And it was spoken. You know, another term we should probably define our terms: the shuttle, the community the shuttle, in Eastern yes. Europe, the village. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, is a uh, is that a Yiddish word? Uh, that which uh, I don't shtetl, want to ask yes Well, no. shtetl obviously comes from the German word stadt, uh, and and so it was a what was it was considered a small city, but it was not a village. Mm-hmm. A village okay. indicates a a country town. It was not a country town. It was a special institution that was more or less invented by Jews out of necessity because uh, they could only do business on certain days. Mm. And uh, many of the laws of various kingdoms forbade them from doing business in certain places. So, so prejudice, they established... bias, uh, what we would today call prejudice and bias. I mean, it yeah, was exactly. a, a way of so life. The, the, the shtetl was a small city that was essentially a mercantile center. Hmm. It was a place for doing business. But that's how it began. But then around it got built up because, you know, when you do business, sometimes you stay and you have a family. And then you have a school. And then you have a this and you have a that and you have another thing. And so eventually they became these, these small... Uh, sites of Jewish activity that included everything from religion to 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 uh, politics to literature to you know na- yeah. you name it, and uh, they were largely in the countryside, um, and Jews often migrated from the shtetlach of Eastern Europe, the Pale of Settlement, which was established by Catherine the Great when she annexed part of Poland. Hmm. Um, 
in in the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, and and uh, Jews moved from the shtetls into the larger cities. And what what a lot of people don't understand any longer is that in Eastern Europe, in particular, Jews often represented 30 to 40 to 50 percent of many of the major cities of Eastern Europe, yeah. like Vilna, like Warsaw, like Lodz, uh, like yeah. Lvov, and so forth. Well, it puts me to, to keep the, the matter going. I mean, there was a rich literature, I know that much, and you mentioned mm-hmm. Sholem Aleichem, who um, in, in, is a, a pseudonym, and he was uh, not, not only a humorist, but he took some of the suffering of the peoples of Eastern Europe, in particular the Jewish people of Eastern Europe, who were subject to periodic pillaging and rape, if I may say mm-hmm. so, otherwise known as pogroms, by the Cossacks, by by the authorities. I mean, this was some grim yeah. stuff. I saw some films. Why would you massacre a kindergarten? You know, this was like mm-hmm. very confronting, very difficult stuff to watch. And yet he took this and managed to find, it's almost unbelievable, some kind of humor and create a uh, create some measure, I don't have the right language even, how to deal with this, some way mm-hmm. to survive. Mm-hmm. Well, this is, uh, I mean, it's interesting that you bring this up, and, and what you've just described is the image in the minds of most, I would say, American Jews, and certainly as a consequence of the Holocaust. That's what yeah. we remember. We remember the pillages and the pogroms and so on and so forth. Yeah. But you have to understand that the Jewish people lived in Eastern Europe for 1,000 years. There were wow. Jewish settlements in Ukraine as early as 700 A.D. Yeah. So let's so, capture the joy and the life. I'm, I so, see where you're going. So... The, yeah. the fact of the matter is that while, yes, the, the pogroms, which were horrible, and especially uh, the uh, uh, Khmelnytsky uh, 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 devastation in the uh, uh, 17th century, and then, of course, the, the horrible uh, pogroms of the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century and the run-up to the Holocaust. This is what people remember. But there were hundreds of years when Jews and Poles and Ukrainians and Lithuanians and Romanians, they lived together. Yeah. And they actually developed many shared customs, shared ideas. I'll give you just one example. Yeah. That that you know one of the one of the 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 most treasured institutions of the Jewish people is what we call the shmata business, right? You probably know the word shmata. A shmata is a rag. It, it, it means the clothing business. Yeah, yeah. It's a Jewish business. Yeah, the, but ta- the word get some shmata, good tailoring. Get some custom tailoring done. Right. The word shmata is Polish. Hmm. Amazing. You, you you we think of gefilte fish. As a, as a special dish for Passover, one of the most important holidays of the year. But gefilte fish is, in Russian, farsherovanaya riba, which is stuffed fish. Huh. And the Ukrainians make a kind of gefilte fish that my grandmother served at yeah. her table on Pesach. Yeah. And so there was a lot of borrowing on both sides, on all sides. There was a, a Jewish underworld, for instance, that contributed many, many Yiddish words to the Polish vocabulary. As, yeah. And also the Cossacks, the worst tormentors of the Jews, appropriated Yiddish hmm. words. It, and does, so, it gives one pause. It does give one pause. I mean, you absolutely. Raised, I, you I, know, and, like, let me, I mean, go ahead. Finish the thought. Then I'd no, like I, I was just going to say yeah. That, yeah. that your show is devoted to the concept of empathy. And right. the, Jew, the history of the Jewish people of Eastern Europe and Poland is like a huge experiment in, in, in empathic relationships by Jews for non-Jews and non-Jews for Jews. And this is one of the great subjects that needs to be explored.
uh, in the history of the Jewish people. Because, listen, the basic biblical injunction, yeah. treat thy neighbor as thyself, is an injunction for empathy. It is an injunction to see yourself as the other and to see in the other yourself. And, and, and this has been the experience of the Jewish people in the diaspora and the, the, the history of the Jews. And I'll tell you the history of the YIVO Institute Please. Is, is a representation of the vicissitudes of empathy. Why? Well, in, in 1941, when the Germans came and they tore Yivo to shreds and, were in, and they murdered practically everybody associated with the Yivo Institute, they seized Yivo's documents and they wrapped them up and they sent them to Frankfurt, hmm. Germany. Yeah. At the end of the war, the U.S. Army discovered these materials and sent them to New York, which is where they are today. Millions of documents and hundreds of thousands of books. But at the same time that the Nazis were doing this in Vilnius, the, the Yivo staff and, and poets and writers associated with Yivo were burying books in the ghetto in the, in, in, the, in the ground, hiding them in secret bunkers, and giving them to their non-Jewish friends. There was even one Polish person, who was not Jewish, who brought a machine gun and gave it to them in, in, in the Evo Institute. And we have the machine gun. Amazing. But we didn't know. But what were, the, what were they going to do? Declare war on Germany at that point? You know. So it was useless. Yeah. But but Yivo only survived because of that kind of empathic response on the part of Lithuanians and Poles. Not all Lithuanian and Lithuanians and Poles. And Ukrainians Not all. too. That's and Ukrainians as well. And I don't, you know, I don't want to whitewash things. But we must never forget those who helped, those who recognized a human core in other people on both sides. So it took, you see, what kind of uh, consciousness did it take on the part of the Jews to give their most precious things to their non-Jewish uh, neighbors? Is that a question for me? God, I mean, I, no, I no, an it's sort of, sort of rhetorical. Yeah, but well, see, I mean, they... it's what you know. Uh, it's what moved and inspired me to invite you to be on the show. The matter of relatedness, exactly, and of, and... of humanity and shared humanity, because a neighbor is a neighbor is a neighbor, and sometimes neighbors don't behave as properly as everybody might wish, and some of them got to behaving very badly indeed. But that's the answer. I mean, because they saw the humanity and, and also took a risk because they knew they were perhaps going down with the ship, so to speak. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we have, you know, we've gotten up to the Holocaust and all of the confronting and difficult and challenging uh, meanings and inferences, and uh, you know, while the Germans were killing every Jewish person they could get their hands on, uh, they were also documenting the greatest crime in history. It, uh, uh, they, there has never been a be probably never been a better documented crime, and you know, God forbid, that's all very confronting. Mm -hmm. And then, so sending the archives to Frankfurt, from mm -hmm. which they could be rescued by Yivo, and uh, uh, and after the war collected and. Uh, what you bring out about about re about recollection and about the in effect the the full rich enjoyable meaningful life that was being lived in Eastern Europe before the murder of the six million right mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, also deserves to be called out and recognized and I had less visibility to that and I think our listeners probably have yeah. less visibility and you see that's what Evo is devoted to we are yeah. even though we have the largest collection of primary source material in the world relating to the Holocaust hmm. and and most people don't know that 
they well USHMM. But what does UH, USHMM have in Washington D.C.? The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have digitized copies. Yeah. M- m- most of which comes from Evo. Same with Yad Vashem. Digitized copies. Evo started c- collecting materials in 1941 and documenting the Holocaust. And so our collection of Holocaust testimonies and Holocaust-related materials is vast. It's huge. But the Evo Institute wants to devote itself not just to the memorialization of the destruction of the Jews of Eastern Europe, but to the life that they actually led, the life that very few people in the United States or anywhere else has any memory of, let alone knowledge of, because it was wiped out. And most of the people who survived and came here had only bad stories to tell. And there are a lot of great stories. I mean, this is a beautiful segue, Jonathan. Pardon me again Mm -hmm. for interrupting, but this is a beautiful segue to the title, the tentative title of this show, How Things Were Done in Odessa, which, of course, uh, is uh, maybe meaningless to some of our listeners, but is a reference to the story by Isaac Babel about... uh, how things were done in Odessa, literally, uh, and you're working. So I segue here. I mean, let you know we're going to have mm-hmm. multiple conversations. You're working on a biography of Isaac Babel, or perhaps you right. say Babel. Either one, I think, works. And how you know? And this is about, among other things, the Yiddish mafia. What's going on there? <laughs> I mean, talk about a list of colorful characters, right? right? I mean, right. I'm about to tell the story, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like, I want to get out of the way. And what, so here's like a segment, here's a single document, which uh, is not really in the archives, but it's a combination of black humor, humanity, tragedy. Uh, what are your, th- mm-hmm. you know, count me out here. Huh? <laughs> well, Isaac, Isaac Babel uh, has a, uh, a very interesting position in in this story because he he knew Yiddish. His first language was Yiddish, and he was thoroughly educated in in Hebrew and in the Torah and the Talmud and all of that. But he wrote exclusively in Russian. He wanted to be a Russian writer. He understood his place in the world as a Russian writer, and he wanted to be a Russian as much as he wanted to be a Jew. And so these two identities are constantly contending within him. But in his Odessa stories, he opens up a world of Jewish life far different from anything that Sholem Aleichem or any of the other Yiddish writers you can imagine uh, wished to tell the life of the underworld. And indeed, there was an underworld. Uh, Look, a Bugsy Siegel didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> And and Las Vegas didn't come out of nowhere, and Hollywood didn't come out of nowhere. There was, in addition to the great rabbis and the philosophers and Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein and all the Nobel Prize laureates and blah, 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 right. there was uh, uh, a, a very thriving liquor trade. There were Jews in various uh, criminal organizations. There were brothels. Look, Evo has a collection of Yiddish pornography. And so, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, I get to use my, my one joke. Fifty Shades of Oy vey. <laughs> How am I doing? But not Fifty Shades of Grey, which has hit the theaters to much whatever. Right. It's Fifty Shades but- of Oy vey here. So, so, yes, there was even <laughs> Yiddish pornography. And yeah. why should there not be Yiddish uh, pornography? It, why, should there, why should the Jews not be human? Yeah, of course. Everybody of course. else is human. And, and, and in fact, you see, this also was completely... The, 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 the Jews who came over here, especially in the wake of the Holocaust and, and, and before then, they wanted to erase the memory of of the totality of Jewish experience. Maybe they never even experienced it themselves. And, and so it was lost. And Jews had this idea of themselves, and, and non-Jews had the idea that all Jews are doctors and lawyers and in <laughs> finance and they're scientists and they're, 
they're, they're pious and, and they don't drink and they don't smoke and they have good families and blah, blah, blah. We have in our archives here an entire archive devoted to abandoned women. That's an women issue. Whose, women whose husbands ran out on them. They came to America, and instead of going to Philadelphia, where they were supposed to go, they went to Mexico and fought with Pancho Villa, God knows what. <laughs> or they, they... <laughs> We're allowed, you know, some of this, Jonathan, is very significant, and we're allowed to enjoy a lighter moment. Uh-huh. I thank you for it. <laughs> so, you well, know, these guys, these, I mean, we need some terms of abuse to describe these schmucks. I mean, help me out here. My, my, you know. Well, there's, in fact, uh, an entire vocabulary <laughs> devoted <laughs> to all of this. And we've just had an exhibition here at Evo called the Yiddish Fight Club, uh-huh. where we have uh, uh, put together a kind of glossary of terms uh, of abuse, of uh, largely physical abuse that would be meted out uh, on the uh, on on the wrestling mat, a uh, mat, or in the boxing match. But uh, these were tough guys. In fact, there was a point in the 1920s and 30s when a lot of organized boxing was controlled by Jews, hmm. and run and there were Jewish boxers. My own uncle was a boxer, a prize fighter, a semi-pro hmm. pi- prize fighter in Chicago. Now, which uncle was this? Was this Uncle Harry? Yeah, this was Uncle Harry. My yeah. God. And, you know, isn't that something? And, right. uh, you know, it, and th- this is an interesting segue, Jonathan. I mean, there, there are basically 101 things which we need to discuss in this somewhat abbreviated conversation. And so I'm going to t- take some liberty here with you. You've been so mm-hmm. gracious. And I always have so much fun talking with you. I mean, with Uncle Harry, who actually I, I knew, you know, yeah. you grew up in Chicago at a time uh, when there were still local bookstores and you could buy and read them. And one could go to a bookstore and meet authors and colorful characters, not all of them mm-hmm. Jewish people, but many of them, Saul Bellow, Ben Hecht, Nelson Algren. You could meet them at the local bookstore and hang out and have a cup of coffee and hang out. And your father, the late Stuart Brent, was one of these uh, bookstore aficionados or entrepreneurs. Stuart Brent Books is a storied name on Michigan Avenue now, sadly gone. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, how did how did these... Uh, so here's a question. Answer any question you want. But here's one. I mean, how did these experiences influence who you became? Any thoughts? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I think about this all the time. I've tried to write about this. Um, yeah. Well, it's and, con- it can be confronting, but you know, anything. Well, I- it's it. Uh, uh, look, I had one uncle who was a semi-pro prize fighter. I had another one who became a cowboy, and my father was a bookseller, uh, scholarly and literary. Yeah. My mother was a concert pianist. But uh, there was always in the background uh, an aura of the Jewish tough guy, hmm. and and that life was not what it necessarily always seemed to be. Uh, but I could never figure out what that was when I was growing up, and and pretty much I don't think my experience was that different from that of most people uh, in my generation, we were shielded from knowledge. Uh, We weren't taught Yiddish. I picked it up because I am attentive to language. But uh, we, my father didn't teach it. But there was always something in the back. I'll give you one example. Yeah. Uh, My grandmother, whom I think you may also have met at some point, Lou. Yeah, um, yeah. I I met the whole Meshbuka at some point. Yeah, she, she spoke Yiddish her entire life. Only Yiddish, no English. She was here for 50 years. Didn't speak a word of English, only Yiddish. But on her deathbed, and this comes back to the subject of empathy, Hmm. on her deathbed, she started to speak a language that no one in the family could understand. Hmm. So knowing that I uh, had become fairly fluent in Russian, Mm -hmm. Uh, I was asked by my father to come and just sit with my grandmother and listen to her talk. And sure enough, uh, 
she was speaking Russian. And she was having a conversation about her neighbor, hmm. an Ivanchik. Hmm. One had Ivanchik. A cow. I must say, I'm blown away. Let me make the point. If this is not an empathic moment, I would not know one. And so this, this wells up within see, her. Let me, and, let me tell you something. Yeah, continue, this please. Was, I'm going to be quiet here. This was stored away in her, at the bottom of her consciousness for all of those years. Yeah. And only came out when her guard was down. And I believe, the more I have thought about this, I believe that that is why she was an interesting personality. She never wanted to impose a uh, 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 restrictions on her children. She did not object to their going out into the larger world. Uh, in the case of my father, my mother was Jewish, but after her death, he married a non-Jewish woman, and my grandmother was completely open to that. Yeah. At a time when many of the elderly people from Eastern Europe and Russia would have looked with abhorrence on on something like this, she was open to it, and and I have I think I've begun to understand why, because in her youth, in that in 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 that moment of her youth, when she was a young girl, she had probably fallen in love with this Ukrainian boy, and uh -huh. she knew the, the backstory comes out here. That's my guess. I have yeah. no documentation for it, but I you know. On her deathbed, she wasn't talking to her husband. She wasn't talking to her son. She wasn't talking to her daughters. She wasn't talking to God. She was talking to this Ukrainian boy. Yeah. Well, Listen. can I reflect on that? Because in some ways, telling a story is one of the things that we do to make our experience a whole, to make it into a whole and complete entity. I mean, Isaac Babel is telling mm -hmm. stories and creating, you know, transforming humor and a, a random gunshot and tragedy and and this wells up i mean it's it's a deeply moving narrative and and mm -hmm. and you know she had something to communicate to this young man to complete her her life and her experience I, we I, I hypothesize right mm -hmm. as you say you never know for sure it's just a moment in in time and it's so great that you could be there. And I, you know, yeah, you know a lot of Russian and, 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 and everything, right? <laughs> um, it's a, I'm well, amazed. I could, I'm I could, you know, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I could make out what she was saying. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of amazing. It was the longest conversation I've ever had, I ever had with my grandmother. Wow. Because I could never talk to her in English. <laughs> yeah, right. All the of Yiddish, a sudden we're right? communicating in a Yiddish, third yeah. language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and you know, just to make the point, this is not uncommon of those who uh, were growing up in the 1950s and 60s and perhaps a little beyond. I had an, a dear, a very dear Italian grandma who spoke fluent Italian all her life and then moved to, uh, retired to Florida City, Florida, and the Mariel boat lift from Cuba, and the Italian then blended into Spanish, and she it just worked just fine. She had a rich social life and communicated with everybody she needed to communicate with as long as it really wasn't in English. If she needed in English, she got my father or myself, to, you know. It sounds a lot like that, and so I can totally, you know, parallel experience, but, uh, mm -hmm. well, it's a treasure. I mean, it's a precious, I mean, really, not to lay it on too thick, but it's a, it's a great moment that you had this experience with her. Yeah, yeah. And that's to be treasured, and it is. It is, you know, uh, about empathy, and I appreciate your calling that out. Empathy, and it's, it's about our humanity and relatedness. You know, and, and I would say that, it is at the bottom of so much of the Jewish experience of Eastern Europe, because the Jews had, despite all of the propaganda of a secluded community, an isolated community, blah, 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 they, they could only exist by virtue of the, the, the goodwill of the people around them. And reaching a point of of a shared experience uh, 
And, and that is embedded in, I believe, the values of the Jewish diaspora of Eastern Europe, which is why that is a culture, from my point of view, that we need to know more about. We need, and Evo, that is Evo's mission to learn more about this culture to, and to help preserve it, because it lives on in America through the descendants of the people who came over. It's, it's a very important component of what we call the Jewish diaspora. Uh, Say and, more about that. Say more about that for our listeners who well, may or may not be. Well, you know, the diaspora means the exiled people, and for... Uh, thousand years, uh, for, for 2,000 years, that meant all the Jewish people in the world, except for the handful that continued to live in what was called Eretz Yisrael, uh, and had continued to live there since biblical times. And indeed, there always had been a Jewish community that stayed there, but it was small. Most of the Jewish people left. They went to Rome, and and and, and from Rome, they went to... Uh, Germany, or, the, or from Greece, they went to Germany, and from Germany, they went to Poland, and they went to Spain, and, and they spread out all over the world. There was a Jewish community in India, for instance, and, and that was all called the diaspora. And, however, by the middle of the 19th century, the highest population center of the Jewish people in the world was in Eastern Europe. And uh, throughout the lands of Eastern Europe, including the Russian Empire, there were, there were some six, six and a half million Jews. Yeah. And, and these people existed for a thousand years in the midst of communities which, by and large, are stigmatized today and and not unrightly because of the Holocaust and so forth, because of all of the horrendous tragedy that, tragedy that took place as largely anti-Semitic. But, but despite whatever it is that the Church taught, despite whatever it is that their nationalistic leaders taught, despite all of that, there was some uh, way by which Jews not only defended themselves, but they throve, they thrived yeah. as a community. The and we have the contribution. And the contribution was... on all sides. And we have the documentation that proves it. We have the documentation that goes back to the 17th, 16th centuries that proves, without a shadow of the doubt, that the Jewish people was never as isolated as it often has been made out to be, that there was always a, a great interest within, at the very core, even within the, religious, the, the core of the religious community, in finding, wonder, in finding outlets and in making connections. Uh, let me give you one story, and this is from Sholem Aleichem's memoir. Sounds good. We have about three minutes left. Give me the story. Okay. He had, Sholem Aleichem is a young boy, and he had a very pious Uncle Pinny, who was a chassid. And if you <laughs> I'm, had laughing, a, I'm sorry, I'm laughing already. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, and if you had a problem with your wife, with the policeman, with the local barber, or with the government, you would come to Uncle Pinny, and he would fix it for you. And you couldn't mess with Uncle Pinny. He was, uh, you know, he was an austere chassid. But he had a little bit too much to drink <laughs> at a wedding. And Sholem Aleichem writes that he takes his Cossack, he throws it over his shoulder, and in the midst of the festivity, he gets down on the floor and he starts doing the Kazachka. And, and, and Sholem Aleichem says he did it with as much fury and passion and, and, and abandon as any peasant would. And he ends, Sholem Aleichem ends this segment of his memoir by asking, how did Uncle Pinny learn that dance? 
And how did he learn that dance? This well, man who is a chassid, who yeah. lives in his own little enclosed community. Well, he learned it because he related to his neighbors. Of course. Jonathan, Precisely. we are out of time. I want to thank you for joining me for this conversation. This conversation needs to go on. I'm going to make it a priority to get you back so we can continue the conversation. Let me say, in conclusion, the rumor of empathy at YIVO is no rumor. Empathy lives in the work being done by you, Jonathan Brent, and all your colleagues and associates at the community there. Next, so a shout out to them as well. Next week, dear listeners, please join me for a conversation with Joseph Palumbo, Dean of the Institute for Neuroscience and Psychoanalytic Social Work, engaging with the struggles of students and parents with learning disabilities. Usually, but not always, the disability is with the students. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in to A Rumor of Empathy with Lou Augusta. Please join us again next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We hope to see you again next week.